This episode is sponsored by Stepping in a Puddle and Soaking Your Socks, the fastest way to ruin your day. This episode is also sponsored by Flavored Water, substituting soda for an artificially sweetened disease. This is Sorry for the Wait. Here we go. Fired up, ready to go. Welcome to the show, folks. Sorry for the wait. A weight loss podcast for regular people by regular people. I'm your host, Seth. And I'm your host, Strawberry. And here we are. Here we are. Here. Episode four. We are with episode four. We're uh, we're really excited today. It's beautiful out today. Oh yeah, it's gorgeous. You know, and uh and and we're just we're back at it again, but without the white vans, you know? It is just damn, Dan. <laughs> I don't like that. Yeah, I'm going <laughs> to cut that. Hey, uh, before we get into just our weeks and stuff, have you ever, did you ever watch? Oh, you to do this to me, huh? I kind of want to because this was something that came across the internet today that I completely forgot about. But did you ever watch a show when you were younger called Kid Nation? I, no, I don't think so. You don't remember don't, what Kid Nation was? I don't remember Kid Nation Fantastic. At all. I'm so happy you have What's it. Kid Nation? <laughs> Kid Nation was quite possibly the worst reality TV show to ever exist in human history. Oh, is this like the Lord of the Flies one where they just like drop a bunch of kids in a town and they're like, you guys figure it out from now? Exactly. They dropped 40 kids into a just a desert town and just said, figure it out. And it's obviously more nuanced than that, but just the the amount of therapy that I think these kids probably need now. Can I stream this somewhere? I don't because I feel like as a teacher, I really need to watch it because I know that there's no good that could come from it, but I kind of need to see it. We're sending out the bat signal to all the listeners that if you have a way to watch the entire one season of Kid Nation, please send it to us. Because no, (laughs) just get it to us, okay? We'll figure it out from there. I would never watch illegally. But there's a there's a there's a point to this, though, is that it's these 40 kids. They're dropped in the middle of nowhere, ranging from like eight years old to like 13, 14. And they just kind of have to make a civilization, right? And of course, like when we deal with kids from camp and when we've dealt with kids from camp, like obviously homesickness comes into play. But like I didn't really notice that many of these kids were were overweight. OK, but were they? Well, no, no, no. I really I'm, I'm, that's what I'm saying is that like mm. I w- watching highlights of the show from this video that I saw come across the Internet today. A lot of these kids like weren't that overweight. There were a few. But I do wonder if you were dropped in. To a scenario like this with 39 other kids that you didn't know in a deserted town and you had to fend for yourself. And each week when they have like a council meeting, like kids who want to just get the fuck out, like can go and leave and just head okay. home. How many weeks are you making it in this weird dystopian, like messed well, up kid society? Okay. As a kid, yeah, I'm, I'm making it one week because I know that if I don't leave, I'm just going to. I'm I'm not going to make it. I'm not joking. Like they showed like these kids trying to make like macaroni that just looked like gruel and and like they're all fighting with each other. And then they only had one bathroom. I'm not joking like this. The emotional trauma that I think this show caused. And meanwhile, people at home are like, this show is fantastic. Like (laughs) great job. Incredible job. And Um, I forget the network that that put it up, but. If, if they still exist anymore, because anybody with an idea that bad should be sued out of existence. Good. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I think where everyone's at years later. So, okay, that just, it was bugging me today. And I was like, you know what? I'll, I'll save that. So, so with that, let's get into our weeks. And so how, how's your week going? Um, this week was actually a really good week. So coming off of last week where I had gained a little bit of weight, um, but I felt good about it because I'd analyzed the things that I'd done wrong. Um, this week, um, it, it, just I've lost more weight than I gained last week. So I've awesome. already kind of like made up for that. That's great. And it feels really good because, you know, it was one thing, you know, last week on the podcast to kind of like talk that talk and I was talking that talk off the air too. Right. But like actually seeing that I followed through with that right. and was see, an and, accomplishment for me. And seeing that you bounced back, like, cause I honestly think that obviously like the shitty week, it makes you feel shitty. And then it's the unknown after that of, can I bounce back? Like, am I going to bounce back or am I going to have another bad week? 
but seeing the bounce back is one of the best feelings in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, this would have completely derailed me any other time that I've ever done a, a so diet have, or plan. What, what would you say is probably the biggest thing that you adjusted from from your bad week? It's really just the mentality, and it's the mentality I have going in, you know, with that kind of finely tuned sense of like, okay, well, I'm going to analyze what went wrong, and then I'm going to work on that. Okay. And, and attacking root causes instead of attacking myself for yeah. doing what, like, I mean, it's only natural for us to mess up every once in a while. Yeah. So not taking any of the, the blame past the point of like just constructive criticism is right. very helpful. Well, cause I think that the first instinct is to just be like you piece of shit and just point at yourself yes. and then, and then you just stop from there and then right. you're just like, okay, well I yelled at myself. So it's okay now <laughs> <laughs> when really, as we've learned years later from, uh, from the mental health, uh, help that we need, uh, and it only makes it worse. So I think attacking the root causes is something huge. So how's your week been? It's been, you know, it's it's funny because we've been putting in so much work, you know, on the show and and mm-hmm. doing this and and we love doing it, but it's a lot of hours and like we're we're crushing it like between like we're crushing our flow, you know. I'm right. I don't want to be overzealous and say like we're already great at this because we're <laughs> we so, haven't even posted anything on air, right. but we are already the number one podcast <laughs> in America. Yeah, and and you know what's funny is that when you we're diving into this medium for the first time and we're just we're seeing the issues and the stuff that we're that we're not great at right now. And, but the thing is, is that when we're seeing the issues that we know we can improve, it sort of correlates to the weight loss and like the amount of time that we're putting in. It's funny because I'm, I'm not as hungry. Like I don't, it's weird that I don't want to snack. Like when I'm just kind of in the middle of doing stuff, which has been incredible. Like I know people say like find hobbies and find distractions, yeah, keep but yourself busy. Right. And this has Idle been, hands the this has been, <laughs> This has been true to that very, very much. And I'm very, very happy with that. And so, I mean, it's consistent and I'm really glad with like the direction that we're going in. And I mean, the scale is the scale, you know what I mean? Like it's still a consistent weight loss, but I don't really give a shit about weigh-in day. Yeah, honestly, the non-scale factors mean so much more to me than the the scale factors. Yeah, and like there is gonna be a week that comes where like I know that I gain weight and like I look forward to like facing that and talking about it, you know what I mean? But until then, like when you drink 800 calories worth of shakes every day, you know you're doing the right thing. Right. And that's the big thing. There's no unknowns in your equation right now. Right. So I'm really, really happy with that. And uh, and so you know what? I was craving some weird shit this week. Oh, my God. I've You know that I've been trying to tell you about my craving of the week. And, and you I know let it. Me. I will not let you. And so I think since you're so excited, I will let you I will let you kick off craving of the week. All right. So. A couple days every week, I try to go um, to Dunkin'. I get myself um, a coffee. Um, I also sometimes get myself the turkey sausage, egg, and cheese on a plain bagel. Yeah, good because, choice. Because, you know, I need to treat myself, but also not hate myself. Yeah, not go overboard. And you haven't been to Dunkin' Donuts recently at all, right? Um, I mean, not since I started really. I mean, working from home, yeah, a couple times just to have a nice tea. So I don't know if this is like a national thing or if it's just like select stores. But the Dunkin' Donuts that we have right here, um, they have this DIY donut kit where they literally give you a bunch of <laughs> like just empty canvases, just donuts. They give you the icing. They give you the sprinkles. Yeah, they're just sick of doing the work. Well, no, they advertise it. They advertise it in a really smart way. They're like, keep the kids busy with this DIY. Yeah, that's everything like, Dunkin now. Kit. And you know what? Honestly, like I'd be lying if I told you that I wouldn't love to just sit down, prepare myself my own <laughs> just- donut. And then eat all dozen of them <laughs> right to the face. Just like color coordinate them for the groups that you need to eat them in. Like, oh, absolutely. And I'd, I'd make some weird shit. Like, this I is would, Donut District 1, and these ones get eaten last. <laughs> I, I'd be like making like a, a strawberry chocolate frosting swirl going around this donut. Like I'd go crazy. How, how many donuts are you actually making before you just go full face plan into the frosting? Um, I, I would never do that because I understand the value of a completed donut. Yeah, because you, you're an artiste at right. that point. You like you, at that point, you could even call them artisanal donuts. Oh, absolutely. Because you have created art, like handcrafted. Right, exactly. And like it's from the folks at Dunkin'. Like it's gonna be good. Oh, absolutely. It's gonna be, it's gonna be good. And I have no doubt that I could down the entire box quick because there were definitely <laughs> times at camp where. Um, me and one of our friends would go to Dunkin' on a period off and just slam back a dozen donuts. 
Yeah, in like a in like a fifty five minute time frame too. Yeah. That's like yeah. food and then, challenge. And then, kind of shit. and then we'd go back and it would be like, okay, fitness time. Wow, you have you you were really excited about that one, and I can absolutely see why. Oh, yeah, that's a. <laughs> it feels good to get that off my chest. Do you want some of my artisanal donuts from Duncan? Oh no! Well, I ate them all, so no. <laughs> it's really hard to see the sign on the dunk at the drive through window and just not be able to get it. But yeah. what's your craving of the week? So. I had I I've been having this craving for a little bit, you know what I mean, but it intensified. Yeah. This week, I want a nor'easter, uh, like a nor'easter, and like, so like a snowstorm of Dairy Queen blizzards. <laughs> uh, when you said nor'easter, I was like wondering yeah, where you were going. Yeah, you're with this. like, oh, is that a croissant? No, it's not. Not I, a blizzard of blizzards, but I, a nor'easter. I want a nor'easter. I want sixty inches of of snowfall blizzard. Because think about it, dude. Like. This is really like my cravings just make me think that I want to live in the CWC MCU. Do you do you know what I'm talking about? The CWC MCU. Well, I know MCU stands for Marvel Cinematic Universe. No, it doesn't, Barry. So oh. what I'm talking about is the cloudy <laughs> with a chance of meatballs uh, oh. cinematic universe. Oh. So that's like that's what I want. The cloudy with a chance of meatballs cinematic universe how many times have you tried practicing that acronym to make sure you didn't mess it up i'm not joking that was take one after i wrote it down wow <laughs> congrats so i i honestly like think about it think about like don't think about the mess let's not think about the not fun parts you know what i mean don't think about the bad i want to go outside i can go just like my slip and slide like i can go out mouth open and just blizzard Slide. up you know or i can just go out with my spoons i could go out with a goddamn thermos and just, oh, hey, Ted, no, I'm just filling up my thermos, you know, you know? and, and yeah, you would know, you what? make a, would you make a snowman out of blizzard? Are you kidding me? Absolutely. And, and then would you eat it uh, after making sweet love to it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> 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 yeah, dude, like, oh my God. Like, and of course, like I would have sort of a machine in my household, you know, like I would have, <laughs> I would have sort of like a, like a touchscreen that's like, it's like blizzo, like blizzard force. 3,000 and it's just like every day I wake up and I'm like, you know what? Maybe I don't want blizzard today. It's going to be a nice day. But if I do, it's like, well, Seth, like, what do you want your blizzard to consist of? You know? And like, maybe I'm just like, you know what? Today's a Reese's and brownie bites with chocolate ice cream. My next question was going to be what, what flavor? So you want like all the flavors just dispersed whenever you want them. Exactly. Like again, a versatility guy, you know, like, like Mr. Versatility, that's what they've never called me. But here's the thing is that like, if I have the choice and I can like hold off a couple of days, I think that that's progress. I don't want it to just like blizzard every day, like in the summertime, like Too much of a good thing. Right. Exactly. And if I could find a way to like confine it to just my household, like so that everyone's like, yeah, that's fucking sad. He's got the ice cream in his yard. Like <laughs> that's fine. I'm cool with that. Cause I don't want to subject everyone else. But if I lived in the cloudy with a chance of meatballs, cinematic universe, I honestly like I would be like I would complain every now and again, but I think that the positives outweigh the negatives. I mean, I'm I'm kind of stuck still on the fact that you have like a perfectly working weather machine and you're using it for this. I mean, just like oh, like all of the like why things. why aren't I fixing climate change? Yeah, or like I don't know, See, making it not snow after it's seventy degrees every time. You know, Barry, it's funny you say that because like why aren't I using this kind of technology for good? But I can deflect that on the billionaires, you know, <laughs> like who have the money to solve this shit. Like we want, like, it's not like, it's not me. Like I do my part. Yeah. I'm just Seth. I have the weather controlling machine, yeah. but it's not my fault. And it's just for ice cream dog. Like, like that's it. It's just for ice cream. And so <laughs> that's, that is my, that's, what? that's my craving of the week. All right. That's a good craving. And honestly, like, oh man, I just, I can't wait to have ice cream again. Like, yeah. I, I'm not joking. Like, it's not like I want like a massive amount of ice cream, but I, I just, I'm excited to have. Honestly, for me, ice cream has been redefined by Halo Top. Yeah. Like being able to eat a whole pint of ice cream guilt free. Yeah, they get oh. it done and they get, they do get the job done. They now have keto flavors too, but that's for another day, honestly. <laughs> so, uh, so we're going to get into our next, uh, you want to introduce our next segment? Uh, sure. So our next segment is going to be lifestyles of the big and famous. We're returning to some to some ones that we've returned to in earlier episodes because we've just been really excited to do them again. Yeah. And so... Um, Would you like to talk about yours first? Yeah, absolutely. I, I can kick this one off. And so... We have coordinated, so we have not shared... So we are not duplicating one. Yeah, no. Th this one we wanted to make sure because I was afraid... I was actually kind of afraid of this one that, that you might pick it, but... My pick for Lifestyles of the Big and Famous this week is uh, Missy Elliott. Ooh, and so I... That's a good choice. Missy Elliott to me is such a boss, dude. Like, 
Missy, Missy Elliott, like you want to talk about bangers, like work it, like the ba- like the baseline for work it is still to me like one of the best hip hop beats of all time. Absolutely, and it's it's so good. And like people people forget, like I can't believe how much time has gone by. But work it came out in two thousand two. Like wow, yeah, I was. If in, work it was a human being, they could legally vote right now. Like we used to jam in the family minivan to like work it when it would come on like mix ninety eight five like in local Massachusetts radio. You know, I will say that like. A couple months ago, I was listening to a lot of like Missy Elliott um, because I like listened to her again on a Lizzo song, and I was like, "Oh, Missy Elliott! I totally forgot about her." But like when I was re-listening to all of like the Missy Elliott stuff, so much of it holds up so oh well. so well. Like she just she withstands the test of time. Yeah, absolutely. And Missy Elliott is a part of one of my favorite like sports memories of all time. Believe it or not. And so the Patriots, oh, and yeah. the, so in so it was in 2015, but it was the 2014 season. The Patriots are playing the Seahawks in the Super Bowl. Right. The game's tied at halftime, and I'm in a shitty mood. You know what I mean? Oh, I remember this one. Yeah. And so <laughs> I'm like super, I'm like super stressed. The game's tied at halftime, and I'm super stressed because like when your team's in the Super Bowl, you don't enjoy it until it's over. Like you're just sitting there trying not to shit your pants, right. and it's game's tied at halftime, and then it's the halftime show, and I'm like, great, the game's fucking tied i'm in a bad mood i gotta listen to Katy perry now like it, it was just i like and don't get me wrong like i've got nothing I'm gonna, against i'm gonna ignore the Katy perry slander i've here. got nothing against Katy perry you know what i mean but like i wasn't ready to hear roar when the game was tied at halftime you know <laughs> what i mean and then all of a sudden like she comes out and she's doing her thing and it's a it's a good performance and then all of a sudden this. missy elliott walks on the stage and just traps like she owned the rest of that show from there yeah because she is just bawling out and Katy Perry's just along for the ride but I remember like seeing Missy Elliott I was like man because I had no idea that she was going to make like a guest appearance like I really was just kind of focused on everything to do with the game and I saw Missy Elliott and I shit you not and I really hope that the people who were with me at the time I literally just went stone cold face and I was like Oh, we're, we're going to win this game. <laughs> I was like, I have no idea why my mood has just changed, but Missy Elliott is doing her thing and the Patriots are going to win this football game. <laughs> and did they? Oh, they absolutely did. Malcolm Butler at the goal line. Like it means absolutely nothing to you, but <laughs> no, I vividly you remember know? that halftime performance, but I could not tell you who the teams even were. And you know what I really love about Missy Elliott is that she spent so many years on features like she would feature for all these really great artists at the time and then she got in the studio with Timbaland and two weeks her debut album was finished. Timbaland is like he himself I mean we could talk about him for our lifestyles of the big and famous at some point but like he is impressive like he took Justin Timberlake from like this guy off of a boy, a boy band and uh you know, turned him into sexy back. Um, so, so what's your take on women in hip hop in general? You know, it's a good question, honestly, because Missy Elliott is one of those milestone figures. Like if you want to go all the way back, cause I know that people look at us and they automatically think, well, yeah, of course those are hip hop connoisseurs. And, <laughs> uh, and then they laugh at us. But I mean, in terms of hip hop history and how we appreciate hip hop, like you go back to people like, MC Light, Salt and Pepper, Queen Latifah, even. Yeah. Missy Elliott is right in there as one of the marquee. Don't forget Lauren Hill. Yeah, of course. And like, because Lauren Hill, like, I consider R&B too, but I yeah. guess like it's, you can mix the two. And, um, and the thing with Missy Elliott is that she's such a, a polarizing and powerful figure in hip hop in, in an industry that I think we can agree is very, very difficult for women to break through it. Oh, absolutely. And of course now we're seeing the most incredible talent in the world. Uh, like uh, Iggy Azalea. Right. Oh, God, you're the worst. You just <laughs> don't shit on my point here, but Nicki Minaj has the number one song in the country right now as we record this. Yeah. And you know what I mean? And a lot of these artists and Cardi B's blown up the charts. Right. And you have all the, and, and then you have Lizzo and you have Chica and you have, you have all these big female artists like, Missy Elliott walked so that these girls could run and mm. and that's the thing and Missy Elliott still being able to put out bangers like years later and being Her, featured she came on, out with an album last year and it was like amazing right and she's and on got no acclaim and she's on tempo right I think yeah, that's the Lizzo Lizzo. song that she's on too and it's just she's timeless and and that's why that's a good one Missy Elliott is queen and like just one more point on the hip-hop and women it's already hard for women to break through in hip hop. That's mm-hmm. that's proven. Yeah. Now you have to be fat. You like you have to be big. You have oh, to Oh, absolutely. She, you have to be a big woman also trying to break through in in 
this type of field. And she just kicked the door down and just said, well, you didn't open up when I knocked. So I just came the <laughs> fuck on in. And I love that. Yeah. And I'll always love that. Um, so the person I picked for Lifestyles in the Big and Famous is um, Michael Moore. Interesting. Yeah. This makes sense because you were watching Bowling for Columbine. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I was trying to figure out a way to like not tip you off, but oh, also watch it in the same apartment. That's really good. Okay. Yeah, and and over the last couple, um, like over the last week, I've been kind of watching all of them. Some of them for the first time, some of them um, for the umpteenth time. But right. I was watching a lot of his his documentaries, and um, I feel like I'll explain a little bit about him just because not everybody might be familiar with him. But he is a like producer, director, writer of several documentaries, um, and Bowling for Columbine was obviously like his first one, probably still his best known one. Yeah, yeah, still that's like his Sistine Chapel. Yeah. yeah, and it came out like you know a couple years after the Columbine massacre, you know that tragedy, and it he has a very distinct style as a documentarian, and that's that's what he makes his documentaries, yeah. and they're very informative. They they do have a, a very obvious point of view to them. And they're very in your face. Like, yeah. it's, it's very much not afraid to talk about the tough stuff. Well, exactly. And that's like kind of what he plays up to. You know, he does all of these things that are just like brash and in your face. But he does these to like the people in power to um, like get results. So like um, in, in Bowling for Columbine, for instance, one of the things they were talking about was um, Kmart had stopped selling um, handguns after that, but still sold handgun um, bullets, including the bullets like the the Columbine killers used Kmart bullets in the massacre. Okay, and so he brought um, a couple of the survivors from Columbine to the headquarters of Kmart, <laughs> and you know they just wanted to have a conversation with like the CEO and and you know tell them that yeah, they and don't voice think their that concerns they should yeah, be selling absolutely. that stuff. And if you're not going to sell the the firearms, why would you sell the ammunition yeah it doesn't make sense you know so at least that consistency and the day that they went in they were kind of like dragged around they were waiting for hours nothing really came of it and so um one of the kids came up with this idea to go to the nearest kmart buy out all their ammunition and bring it in for a whole big press stunt at the kmart oh i love that and so they came in with like all the press and within like a half hour the vice president of the company was down saying that they were phasing out all ammunition not just handgun ammunition see and you know what's funny about that is that people are very hot and cold on Michael Moore. You know what I mean? Because he talks about the tough things. Right. And whether you want to hear it or not, but he makes content to try and make you see things a little bit differently. Yeah. And I think that's why people have like a very either, like you're either very hot or very cold on him. But that kind of a stunt right there is awesome. Yeah. Because that's the kind of action you want. Exactly. Like, like everybody talks about like the power of the people and like that's exercising the power of the people. And one other quick point I want to make about him he, um, you know, one of the other things that I think people do is they dismiss him because his political views tend to be pretty liberal. Yeah. Um, and so they just kind of dismiss him. And, and I think that the the in your face nature of his documentaries kind of turned some people off. Well, yeah. yeah. And and I, I get that. But I also think, you know, at no point does he pretend that he's not really giving his opinion. Like he's, right, he's not facts. trying to mask it as something else. Right. It's obvious to anybody who watches it, no matter what you believe in, that like he's giving his point of view and he's supporting his point of view with like facts. A lot of the interviews that he does with people is heartbreaking, like very yeah. real emotional stuff. One of his um, documentaries is called Sicko and it was about the healthcare industry pre Obamacare. And like some of the interviews are hard to watch. Just very hard to watch. And I have to imagine that making that kind of content, like you're very free, you know what I mean? But but you have to be ready for, you have to be ready for the backlash. You know what yeah. I mean? And I think he has handled it very well. Like there have been incidences where he's like melted down and freaked out a bit. Yeah, no. But I think the mental anguish of that, like it gets to you after a while. Well, and he's not a, he's not a, a perfect person, obviously. And nobody, nobody is. is. But I think for me, like... Growing up, like, I think he was one of the people that really kind of cemented my interest in politics. Well, so that's what I wanted to ask you is that like, it, when you look at his work and what he's done, even the stuff you've seen over and over again and the stuff you've seen for the first time, like, how has he shaped you? Well, I think, like, anybody who knows me kind of, like, knows that, 
you know, I'm, I'm kind of like a jukebox. If you put a dime in me, you're going to listen to the whole song right. when it comes to <laughs> politics. Oh, I know. So, <laughs> but, um, you know, and, and kind of my whole family's like that, but watching Fahrenheit 9-11, mm. which was um, a kind of about like the war on terror and kind of the whole Bush administration's foreign policy at that point. Um, and it came out in the 2004 election. And um, like that was a very eye opening thing to me. And it really piqued my interest in politics. And I also just think, you know, he, even though he's a large guy, isn't embarrassed by that. Like he puts himself out there. Right. And like that's not his identity. And when you're a documentary writer, like you can direct it, you could produce it, you can write it. You don't have to go in front of the camera. Right. But he does because he and his his character of himself of like going into this, you know, corporate building and demanding to talk to the CEO, like that's part of it too. Right. And I think that he's not ashamed of that. I think that's such a cool thing too that he opened your eyes to politics too, because as a very liberal person that he is, you do as as much as I hear you and we have discussions about politics, you do a very good job of seeing both sides and not just... Thank you. Well, because, I try. Well, I think if most people, like mostly liberals, will watch Michael Moore content. And so for you to have be opened up like to that by him and still be able to see the other side of the argument is a very significant impact, I think. Well, and I also think he kind of gets painted as like super liberal, but he's a lot more, I guess, middle of the road than you would think. Um, just because, you know, he's talking about the Columbine massacre. And so obviously the gun control aspect is a part of that, but he also really takes the media to task on how like the media, like they, all they do is scare people they every day on part. the nightly news. And that's why people are so f- afraid that they go out and, and buy all these guns. So you can blame the NRA and you can blame all these things with the guns, but like the media is a big problem. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that a lot of people don't talk about. Mm. And I don't think that that's a liberal stance to take. I think that's a very, Oh, that's a very universal yeah, stands to take because I think both sides of the political stre- like spectrum have an issue with how the media portrays things. I I really was not expecting that. Like you had you had given me hints, and I was trying to figure out, and I should have put it together when you were watching Bowling for Columbine again. Yeah. But uh, but that's really good, and that's a that's another wrap on lifestyles in the big and famous. And so we'll uh, we'll move on into our main topic of the day, and the title of this episode. You can't eat with us. Good, well played. I was really hoping that you would uh, you would finish that. So, so you can't eat with us. Uh, it's a little bit of a take on Mean Girls, uh, and we think that it <laughs> that it fits kind of nicely. But I mean, it's I think it fits perfectly coming off the topic of the media with yeah. Michael Moore. But this is all about the media's perception about who is fat and what they consider to be fat, and the effect that it had. On us. Uh, yeah. And I think also like the effect it has on everybody. Yeah. I like th- there's just such a distorted like view of like what makes a person like look good and what makes a person like fat. And I'm so glad that you said that too, because even though like we are a weight loss podcast and we're big people like this topic touches everybody. You know what I mean? It, yeah. And so sorry in advance. Uh, we're, we're hoping nobody gets offended here. Yeah. No. I, and I don't think anybody should because this is something that I think is very important to talk about because... The big one that we've talked about more so than any other topic is kind of this, because we talk about this all the time, Mm -hmm. but Kelly Clarkson is the perfect example and how the media just tore this poor woman to shreds over her size throughout her career. What expectations do we have for people? Right. The thing like when you see all these magazine covers, that's like X celebrity gains X pounds. One, how do you know that? So that's one. (laughs) But two, like... Growing up, like we would see, we would see celebrities that would be looked at as fat, and then we would look at ourselves and go, "Holy shit! Well, what will they think of me?" Yeah, and and especially like, uh, like I think it's much easier for us as males to go through this. It's Absolutely. way easier, Absolutely. you know what I mean. But for for young like women out there, like, and of course, like we're not really that qualified to talk about like what impact that has because we can't speak to that. I just know that if it made me feel that shitty, it made girls in the same position (laughs) feel twice as shitty. Exactly. Like for us, like we like because every movie you you see like the ripped jock guy or the ripped jock guy and who's always the loser in like these like early 2000s like raunchy cult comedy films. It's always the fat kid. Well, and, and or, or or I'm sorry, uh, like or it's they're the bully. 
Oh, see, I was going to go the other direction. I was going to say a lot of the times, like, you can only have a fat character if they're funny. Really? I you know, I think it plays both ways because, like, it's always, like, you either have the funny fat guy or the fat guy is the bully. Like, Billy Madison, like, all the O'Doyles. Like, O'Doyle rules. Like, they're all fat. In Arthur, the the thing, like, Binky Barnes. Like, Binky Barnes, <laughs> like, was a bigger dude, and he was always cast. In Hey Arnold, it's Harold. Yeah. Like, it, there are so many TV shows and, and media perceptions that fat people either have to be hilarious, which by nature, a lot we of are. us are, and then two, <laughs> two, they either have to be the bully. And, and this yeah. has been something that has been perpetuated that I have noticed my entire life because when I would get bullied in school and I want, like, oh, man, I learned it at a very young age, like, when I would watch some of these cartoons, and I'm like, well... Do they think that I'm fucking Harold? And right. so therefore, do I have to conform to that? And so I would end up trying to be extra nice and like not be a dick. Was I a dick growing up? Sometimes, of course, we all are. But It's called being a kid. But the thing is, is like I always felt like I was going to have to be slid into that role. And it's much more enjoyable to be the funnier guy and then to be the then to be the bully that everyone's like, don't go near the fat kid because he's just going to sit on you and squish your goddamn face. Right. And, and that's a big thing with media portrayal. And I, I think it also right now we're in a very interesting moment in time with this healthy at every size movement. I, I'm so glad you brought that up because I wanted to discuss that, too. So what 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 is your well, first, why don't you do you want to give a little background to it? Well, so I just the background in the movement that I see is one that I inherently do agree with. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and that's cause that's me and that's my opinion. And when I see healthy at every size, I see an age of body positivity, which is something that I think we sorely need because absolutely, because just because you look at somebody and you think they look a little bit bigger does not mean that they are unhealthy. You don't know their medical history. You don't know their doctor visits. Like, like there is a point to be made there and an argument to be had. And that as a whole with body positivity and accepting yourself and loving yourself instead of doing what we did our whole lives, which was absolutely hate ourselves, I think is very, very important to be teaching the youth of America and people who are just living through it right now. Well, and I think I think there is kind of something to be said about, um, you know, healthy at every size. I mean, not every size can be healthy. Right. And I think that when people say healthy at every size they don't mean to say it in the sense of like, I can be a thousand pounds and I am perfectly fine. Yeah, I don't like, think like anybody means problem. it like that. But I think that that's where it gets a lot of hate from is that like people take everything to like the logical extreme. Right. And like, well, what do you mean that, you know, you're healthy at every size, you know, but clearly there is some, you know, ideal, like medically, um, some range of weights that is is more healthy than ones that are way more or way less. Well, I also But that doesn't mean that, you know, you can't just look at just like a fat person on the street and a skinny person on the street and and an average person on the street and be like, "Okay, you're healthy, you're not healthy, you're not healthy." Like you can't diagnose that. Right. You cannot be the judge of that. And I understand that it's going to be so easy for people, especially people who have never lived big, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you've never lived big, then you're just going to look at somebody and go, "Well, and they're, like they're going to point at themselves and be like, well, I look like this and you look like that. You unhealthy. Like, and that's going to be the hard stop rule because apparently like we can't live in the middle. You well, have to be either on one end or the other. Well, and, and I also think there's something to be said, though, that there are people that just fall a little bit too much on that side of the spectrum where, you know, healthy at every size has like that asterisk of of talk to your doctor because, you know, as a fat person, going to see your doctor is always a little bit of an embarrassing experience because you know what they're going to say. You know they're going to say, you know, you could you could stand to lose 60 pounds. Yeah, like, hey, Seth, you're still fat, huh? You really have not slimmed down. Oh, thank and, you. <laughs> and and the truth is, is that obesity does have negative health effects as far as, like, it does increase chances of other conditions. X, Y, and Z, yeah. And, and so when your doctor tells you to lose weight, they're not doing it from a place of I'm judging you based on how you look. They are doing it from a medical standpoint. And you should trust your doctor in that sense. Right. I'll never forget one of my doctors because like I had gone into like my yearly checkup and I knew that like I it wasn't going to be a good one. <laughs> and I remember going in and being a little bit heated because this was like during a phase where like I was a little bit angrier and like I would snap a little bit easier. And I remember classic Harold. <laughs> Fuck off. And I remember sitting there and and he was just like, when are you going to get this under control? And I was just like, get off my back. 
And and we had it. I think it, that's a natural reaction. Right. And I think it is because, of course, like I think about it every single day of my life. But he said something very, very significant there where he goes, what do you think I'm trying to do? He's like, I'm not trying to make you feel like shit. And he goes, but do you know what the Hippocratic Oath is? And of course, I, I was like, well, do you, no harm. Yeah, do no harm. Right. And he goes, so what would I be doing for you if I just said, hey, Seth, all good, man. <laughs> Keep on keeping on, brother. <laughs> yeah, just just have some blizzards. And uh, and once I heard that, I was just like, well, well, shit. OK, like I get I get it now. And like, of course, you're still upset about it. But mm -hmm. I think that's very important where like you want to love who you are. We all deserve that. Everybody deserves to be comfortable with themselves and in their own skin. Right. But to always, and I mean always, heed the advice of medical professionals, especially, I mean, now more than ever, is just to trust the experts and that they are there to help you. Well, and one last point I'm going to make is that when it does come to people who are, you know, obese, you know, even the term I don't like is morbidly obese, but, you know, even when it comes to those kinds of people where, you know, they are, are past that point where it could be a healthy weight. I think something to also consider is just like your attitude if you talk about that with somebody because yeah. honestly their health is none of your business. And you know, obviously we want everybody to be healthy and in a lot of ways, you know, we are seeing with this pandemic that like in some ways your health is everybody's business, but obesity is not contagious. Right. Exactly. Like, and I think this all draws back to what the media says about big people, because like the reason why, like we feel like shit half the time is because we're constantly seeing you're seeing these covers like of either magazines or you're seeing these stars of TV shows. And now it's starting to get a lot better in terms of like inclusivity, especially amongst people of size, but like people who live big. But all the time growing up, it was just like, I don't look like that. Right. And if I don't look like that, am I a piece of shit? And then it would get reinforced like at places like school or on the playground. Or, or clothes shopping. Right. Especially for girls who go into a clothing store and then they see that they need to be a twig to fit into a size eight. Yeah. And like it it really blows because like there are all these styles that I'm sure we wanted to wear as kids. And oh, yeah. Yeah. And you look at like your friends who are wearing them and they're like, well, why? They got to wear so much cool shit than I did. Right, exactly. And you're just trying to figure it out. And then you turn on the TV and it's like, it, it goes, it goes super glamour ad, ad for hydroxy cut, like super glamour ad, ad for this diet, like this diet fad. And then you get to that special age where you're no longer even able to shop in the same store as people. They're like, you go to a fat and wide store yeah, you go to destination like, xl you big piece of shit and yep, like and, and pay hey, extra because you need a lot of cloth and honestly i love dxl dude like oh, yeah, i'm actually it, gonna kind of miss dxl <laughs> I, well no i don't think that we're gonna miss dxl because i think that dxl like our experience in dxl is what normal people feel in a regular clothing store. God, that's going to be so weird to like, feel on a consistent basis. You walk basis. into a clothing store and you don't immediately go, okay, well, if they don't have it in the largest size possible, right, then I can't get exactly. it. Exactly. And so, I mean, when it comes to the media, there needs to be more of a push. I, I still think that there's just such a long way to go. And I think that we have a lot more work to do. Just to touch on is I feel like the media often associates obesity with laziness. And I mm. really hate that. Do you know how much work it takes for me to get out of bed and lug this fat ass around the <laughs> the city? Like, like it takes it. Like, I mean, obviously, like if you were to just walk around, like it's more work for a fat person to do that than a skinny person. Like, right? And you just don't know, you know what people are going through. And and usually it has nothing to do with like that. It's usually just the calories going into the body. I could have spent two hours a day in the weight room and I would have still been gaining weight because I was eating like yeah, garbage. The nutrition wasn't there. It right. was nothing to do with laziness. And so I think that by poor impulse control, I think by talking about these things though, like at least trying to shine some sort of a light on the fact, especially for people at home who like, who grew up feeling these exact same things. Like you just have to like you, we don't need to embrace being physically massive. But embrace living big as yourself, yeah. if that makes sense. Just like, yeah, it, it's it's all about the love. You can love yourself and, and still recognize that it's not the ideal perfect thing. But you know what? You're you and you love you. And that's what we found at camp, honestly. And that's why we had that su like such a strong camaraderie amongst people, because you get to this place where everyone's like, oh, my God, you feel 
the exact same way that I feel. You feel normal amongst your peers for the first time. Right. And, and that, honestly, that gave us our childhood. It really did. Like if we didn't have that and we didn't have that type of camaraderie that we were never going to find at home because we were too busy getting shit kicked in our face half the time, we were all in a, like, I think it's a microcosm of life, which was a thing that we heard commonly. And uh, you know what? I honestly think that's a good way to segue this into our final segment of the day. Which is? The Fat Camp Follies, baby. Woohoo! Like, yeah, like we are back with another camp story. And the title of this Fat Camp Follies is The Woes of, of Weigh In. And so, folks, as you can imagine, at Fat Camp, especially for those who were never there, we know all of our camp friends know this day so well. Oh, yeah. But for people who never went to camp, we weighed in every Sunday. And Sunday was game day. Like, that's kind of what it felt like. Oh, yeah. This was this was when you found out, like... Yeah, like, what did my work result in? You know what I mean? And, like, there were some greats. And, and there, there were, were some bads. <laughs> there were some bads, There man. were some really bads. And, and then there was also just, like, the funny. Like, the like just, <laughs> like, the funny. Like, we call it the woes of weigh-in because, obviously, alliteration. But just, <laughs> like, weigh-in day, to me, just holds a special place in my heart. Because you wake up later than usual, right? Well, unless you were on girl's side and they had to wake up and weigh in before breakfast. God, that was always a bone of contention among them. I'm going to get so many texts about that to be like, you never. <laughs> so you never had to wake up early. And it's funny because the response could be, we did. Because one time every summer they thought it would even out if the boys woke up first. Right, exactly. And it never did. And so the guys are just sitting there like chilling like we, because on boy's side, we got to sleep in, which was super dope. And and like, of course, like when we were counselors, it never really mattered because our campers would be up still at like seven being like, you want to play a board game? And I'm like, <laughs> go back to sleep, dog. <laughs> like, it is the worst. But but we would go. It was always cereal. Cereal. Oh, yeah. There, that was the only day. Every day you had the option for cereal. But that day it was only had it was cereal. cereal Sunday, baby. Like and you like, here's the thing. When I when we were campers, right? I want to take it back to when we were campers. Mm -hmm. When I woke up on Sundays, even though I knew that I was doing the right stuff like all week and I was busting my ass and we were working really hard, I was so nervous to eat on Sundays. Like, I, I was just... Really? Yeah, and I think it's just because, like, I'm naturally nervous, but, like, I would sit in Sunday breakfast and I would grab my cereal and then I would just kind of hang on to it. And I'm just like, what if this makes and i it was such an, a ridiculous way to think that a lot of my counselors helped me get through right like, like some of just camp legends who who were my counselors at the time that really were just like you gotta you you gotta eat well and, and one thing you know i one, one thing i think that's important when you think about weigh in at camp is that there definitely was a mentality that the camp tried to push which was that the number doesn't matter right but obviously to the people who were getting weighed in, that number is very important. Oh, of and course it to is. To some people, it was more of a fixation mm. than just being something that's important. Especially because, some of our friends. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Like if they if if they had a bad week, and even us sometimes too. Like if we had a bad week, we would just be like, God, well, shit. Like what did I do? And sometimes it wasn't anything. Sometimes it's just your body just adjusting and getting used to it. My but, favorite excuse the campers would sometimes give, like if they didn't lose that much weight, they or or like other counselors would give if like they gained weight, is that like, oh well, muscle weighs more than fat, so I just like put on a lot of yeah. muscle <laughs> like, in this one week. <laughs> so I I wanna. What's the craziest thing, either when you were a camper or when you were a counselor? What's the craziest thing you saw on weigh in Sunday from from a camper? From a camper? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so from a camper, um, I, I think it's like the campers sometimes think that like, hey, you know what? Good time for a last minute workout. And yeah. so like they'll be like waiting in line, like like jogging in place yeah, jogging or like place doing, or doing jumping jacks and like a quick 30 push ups before getting and on it's the like, scale. I'm sorry, this is not going to change your number, bro. That's so funny. So the the most nuts thing that that's I did, not a test you can cram for. I did end up laughing about it afterwards, but I was a junior counselor at the time. So like I was just so nervous about like making sure that I was doing a good job. And just for context, junior counselors did have to weigh in. Oh, we did. And like there was no option. But this one wasn't even to do with me. This was just one of my campers. Oh. And uh, and he gets on the scale. Right. And I'm just standing there like kind of making sure that they all get in. And this kid just strips down right to his boxers, which like <laughs> most of us did, but just strips down right to the boxers. And 
And he's just standing there all confidently. And he's got this weird smirk on his face. And I'm like, man, like what? What is he up to? Because like he had caused trouble in the past, but like in a funny way, like innocent, like, and I, I see this smirk on his face and then I look over by his shoes and there is an, an empty, two empty gallon jugs. And I look back at him and he just goes, watch this. Oh my God. And he gets on the scale and he gains four pounds. <laughs> And I am biting my hoodie. I am I am trying to conceal my laugh because I had put it together very quickly. This kid, he told me afterwards he drank those two jugs. He drank both of them twice right before oh he got on the skin. God. Like, how do you not get sick? And how did none of my other co-counselors see about him? that? Because I'm inside, like, waiting for them to all get on the scale. And, and I just remember him looking off at me, and he just goes, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I am trying not to lose my mind because and so we get out of there we go back to the bunk and I oh. I am so you know like when something is so funny but you are like you're so mad but you respect the bit like oh, I've had that moment before <laughs> with my campers for and, sure and I remember just being like buddy like why and he's like I honestly just woke up with the idea and just went for it <laughs> <laughs> and at that point, I really couldn't be mad because, like, he's a kid. Like, yeah. he's just messing around. Like, the water weight will come off next week. Yeah. But he just the just the sinister look over and just go watch <laughs> this. <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm like shitting my pants. It was so funny. Now I'm I'm glad you mentioned. Um, so you had kind of qualified the question at first by saying, what was the funniest thing you've seen a camper do? Yeah. But I need to talk about the funniest thing I've seen a counselor do. Oh, jeez. Because. <laughs> This guy, and I won't use names, but he he did the same thing where he kind of like stripped down to boxers as a counselor to weigh in, which is always a little weird or awkward. But um, he goes up and he just like does this like dance playing music from his phone. Like, <laughs> like he's like, walking into a prize fight. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I recorded that on Snapchat because I thought it was the funniest thing and I don't have it anymore. Like the but Rocky video theme, was, like <laughs> Yeah, like it was some sort of like eye of the tiger, like pump you up, like... And, and just and looking he, at the directors of the camp's face, like while he walked up there and he just was not having it. <laughs> Did he gain weight? Uh, I don't think so. Oh man, that would have been even funnier, no, honestly. He was, he, this, this was a counselor who was trying to lose weight, yeah. and, like putting in good work. It would have so. been like a get on the scale, get off the scale. <laughs> 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 and then like, honestly, just weigh in as a whole right? Weigh-in was a very like successful day, but it was also just kind of like full of almost like organized chaos. Oh yeah. Because they didn't really like, I mean, at, at first they used to like to have lazy Sundays, but they did not like that. Yeah. But then we kicked it into gear. And so honestly, like way into me will always have a special place in my heart across every weight loss camp that I ended up being at. And, and you were just at the one. Do you remember the week that we were JCs and we were the only two JCs who lost weight? So when we were junior counselors, right? <laughs> there were like 14 of us or and, something. And when you're a junior counselor, like you have privileges, but, but you, but you're a junior counselor and which is those rules are put in place like for a reason because like we were all 16, 17, like we were idiots. Right. Like if we were going off in, like, I, like, I don't we're know. We're still kids. We did still need to be on right. the program. And also like what bar could we have even gotten into? Like <laughs> with 16, like, yeah, I had a beard when I was 12, but like that's different. You know what I mean? <laughs> but that week, I'll never forget the time that like a bunch of the counselors were allowed off camp and everyone just shoved their faces and like honestly we ate a little bit too ourselves it was also kind of like a a so-so idea from the start because the only night off the junior counselors could leave was like the day before weigh-in right so exactly so it was, it was really always setting setting us up for that so we didn't go nuts when we went off camp but some hence the weight loss right. for the two of us and some of but some of our friends man just getting all the skill you're up too Getting on the scale, you're up three. Getting up scale, how are you up five? <laughs> and then we get on, and we didn't lose much that week. No, I think I lost like one pound. And I think I lost maybe, I either lost two or two and a half. And I just remember being, and I remember coming out being like, he's got to be so, I I felt the same way. Yeah, I was like, he's got to be so mad at me. And then we meet up with all of our friends, and they're all like, how much did you gain? And I was like, what? <laughs> 
<laughs> and we just laughed right in their faces. And I remember like we had our, a big celebratory moment there because we were like, well, our jobs are safe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like we're fine. And so, I mean, it just adds to like weigh in is just such a fun day, but it can be a very stressful day. And I think well, and I think it really translates to back at home where yeah. you can't be putting too much stock into your weigh in days. You can't because right. if you do. Then one, then again, like that one bad weigh in is really going to screw you up. Well, and I also think along with the weigh in days, it, it is, it's so true that the number on the scale is really not that important. Yeah. It tells, it, it gives you some data that you could use to tell how you're doing, but it's not the be all and end all of how successful you are. Right. And that's, uh, and that's, that's our, that's another fact camp follies, honestly. So we're going to go into closing thoughts and honestly, it's, it's funny as we're, I mean, like we said in the beginning, as we're starting this out, like we're seeing like the bumps and bruises that we're taking like along the way. And if you're still with us, obviously you mean the world to us. And absolutely, we're just going to keep it going because we're going to keep improving. I mean, to be four episodes down and I think that we're starting to at least be more comfortable. Um, it, it's huge for us. And the response that we've still been getting and that we hope we're still getting when we launch is is massive and we yeah, just I hope people like it and we just want to say a big thank you to everybody and so uh and so make sure you stick around make sure you subscribe everywhere and and like us on all the social pages but we won't try to name drop them this time yeah and you know what until next time i'm seth and i'm strawberry and this is sorry for the wait